Good morning, p Daily Show, live here on Instagram, live now on Facebook. Happy Tuesday morning. Hope your Tuesday is off to a great start. Hope you're having a great week so far. My name is Alan. I'll be your host this morning. Currently serving as CEO of ICE and faculty member in our fitness athlete division. Here, not on Fitness Athlete Friday, but on Clinical Tuesday to talk about a cool case study with a patient with some very complex cardiac symptoms. So happy to talk through this case study here with you this morning. Before we get started, uh, come learn from us on the road. We got a bunch of courses coming up before the holidays begin. In two weeks, the weekend of October 24th and 25th, we have a couple courses going on. We have professional bike fitting certification out in Minneapolis with Jason London. We have Fitness Athlete Live out in Denver, Colorado at the Denver Police Academy with Zach Long. And then we have Justin Dunaway down in Richmond with Total Spine Thrust. You can join Dustin Jones and Christina Previtt online for Modern Management of the Older Adult Essential Foundations. That course begins October 28th. The weekend of Halloween, you can join Jeff Moore down in Florida for lumbar spine management. And then the weekend of November 7th and 8th, we have Fitness Athlete Live again out in New Jersey with Zach Long. We have cervical spine management the week after in Charlotte, North Carolina with Jordan Berry. And then the weekend of November 7th and 8th, we have Older Adult Live in Bear, Delaware with Dustin Jones and Total Spine again in Wake Forest, North Carolina with Justin Dunaway. So a lot of great courses coming your way. If you are signed up for a reminder for Virtual Ice, our online mentorship group, you got an email from me just a little while ago with early access to sign up to Virtual Ice, get access to all the past content, and get plugged into the current content coming up as well. Tonight, for example, we have Practical Clinical Marketing with Sarah Heron and Kate Blankshane coming up. We have TMD Management next week with Zach Morgan and Jordan Berry coming up. And then we have a lot of guests. We have special guests every month during Virtual Ice this year. We just had Dr. Nick Winkleman talk about coaching and queuing last week. That was an absolutely fantastic edition of Virtual Ice. Uh, in two weeks, we have Fitness Forward Primary Care with Julie Fouché and Danny Yercurio coming up as well. So get plugged into Virtual Ice. Sign up for the reminder. Get plugged in early this week. Otherwise, we open enrollment next Next Tuesday. I'm personally looking forward to the adaptive athlete session with Logan Aldridge and Alex Zirkenbach. That's kind of my jam, so I'm looking forward to that session. So, speaking of complex patients, clients, and athletes, I want to talk today on Clinical Tuesday through a case study about a patient with some very, very complex cardiac history and uh, how, how it's been going and what we've been doing. And so this is a patient population that can maybe scare us a lot when they have a, a lot going on, both uh, cardiac-wise and comorbidity. We can maybe be scared to get them moving, uh, maybe have them often doing a lot of supine or, or seated stuff to try and play it safe. And typically when we, when we encounter these patients in uh, the physical therapy plan of care, these patients often get underdosed and don't get much better because we're, we're often so scared of, of what's going on with them. So this patient came to see me, started her plan of care a few weeks ago, 74 years young, uh, six bouts of cardiac arrest last year, um, died and revived six times in the hospital, spent a very long time almost three weeks in the ICU uh, on a ventilator, lots of, of time spent prone, um, came home, did some rehab after getting out of the hospital, and unfortunately on her way to rehab one day uh, was in a car accident, which resulted in uh, the beginning of a dissection of her descending abdominal aorta. So already having some cardiac stuff on board, already battling got a lot of comorbidities, and then unfortunately is involved in a car accident that just kind of exacerbates all the stuff that's going on. And so this patient was basically put on bed rest for an entire year while that aorta healed up, but then it was cleared to exercise and uh, what started uh, with her car cardiologist was, was a fantastic uh, kind of way to get this patient to start to buy in to physical therapy and exercise because 
he uh, he cleared uh, this patient to exercise and, and basically said you're released and she said well now what he said something that's fantastic to say to a patient the heart is a muscle we need to use it so you need to go and start some physical therapy and start to use that heart now that it is healed and start to get that heart stronger and so when a patient comes into the clinic with with all of this history on board it can be quite scary and it can be hard to think where do we start there is so much going on like where do we even begin there there are a million things uh, that we need to work on where, where could we possibly even uh, come to to an agreement on where to start and I think as with any other patient that walks into your clinic we need to understand what their goals are what what are their needs what are their functional demands what are we expecting uh, or what are they expecting to be able to do after completing physical therapy what what are they hoping to be able to do and so talking with this patient and establishing goals she says right away hey i have not been doing anything for a year i would love to lose 30 pounds i would also love to get much much stronger i need to be able to play and babysit my grandkids I am noticing I can no longer get in and out of the bathtub, so I, I'm losing function. She's, she's noting a, a loss in function, and she says everything I do is just so taxing. I'm just so tired and fatigued all the time, and I just can't seem to have any energy even when I'm doing essentially nothing. So establishing those goals of things we need to work on. Okay, immediately I know this patient wants to work on picking up and getting in and out of the bathtub. So we need to work on functional strength. We need to work on transfers, floor transfers. We need to work on chest and shoulder strength. If we're trying to get down into a bathtub and lift kids up, we need to be working on deadlifting to, to be able to work on lifting and, and leg strength. And then establishing a, a really robust baseline with this patient. Here is a patient that vitals are important to know what their baseline is. We're maybe not going to be using vitals a lot to, to note any change because there is so, so much medical complexity on board and also that the vitals are artificial due to all the medication that this patient is on. But establishing vitals and then getting some functional outcome measures on board. Looking at what is your five times sit to stand? What is your 30 second sit to stand? What is your tug? But also going beyond that. This is a patient that wants to get back to full function. And so five times sit to stand, 30 second sit to stand tug is okay. But this is a patient that wants to be babysitting her grandkids. So we need to be looking at capacity tests beyond just the AP uh, ATP PC energy system, right? We need to be looking at longer duration bouts. And so this is a patient um, that I want to be looking at something like a two minute step test with. So gathering all those baselines can give you a good idea of where this patient stands, what's up with their aerobic power, what's up with their aerobic capacity, what's up with their strength, their anaerobic uh, bouts of, of performance. And just knowing based on how this patient performed, okay, we need to be working on both strength and power. Um, our, our tug and five times sit to stand were not good, but we also need to be working on longer intervals. We need to be building aerobic capacity, both short and long intervals, because we gassed out a lot on the two minute step test and had to take a lot of breaks, which means we don't have that long term energy reserve that we need to do things like chase the grandkids through the yard. And so being really thorough with our assessment and our testing and, and choosing appropriate tests that might measure a wide variety of energy systems can tell us what we need to work on in therapy. And so taking all that data, taking those, those tests, that five times sit to stand, 30 seconds sit to stand, the tug, the two minute step test, shows us what we need to work on and what does that actually look like. And before we get into what does the, the plan of care look like, we need to know what are our precautions. Given this patient's medical history, the cardiac history, what are we worried about? Well, obviously we want to know of anything going on with, with chest pain during exercise, right? We have a, a long history of cardiac arrest. We know we have um, a, a healing, but not fully healed and normal um, dissected aorta. And so we need to know overall, this patient is going to have a lot of reduced cardiac efficiency. What does that mean and, and what do we care about and why? We know when we don't have uh, high grade cardiac efficiency on board, what's gonna happen? We're just not moving blood around as well. So that's gonna lead to a lack of energy. 
uh, lead to quickly fatiguing, but also after exercise, after PT, we have to be careful um, that this patient doesn't develop a lot of soreness. Not just because she's generally deconditioned and has been sedentary for a long time, but because literally we, we can't shuttle chemicals around in the blood as efficiently as normal. And so we need to be carefully managing volume with a patient like this. We maybe need to intentionally underdose this patient as, as Dustin and Christina would would tell you uh, if you listen to older adult Wednesdays and be careful that we're monitoring her response to exercise appropriately. We don't want a patient to be so sore that they are bedridden for two or three or four days. And so we need to carefully manage volume, especially at the beginning of the, the plan of care, just knowing this patient doesn't have the, the normal cardiac efficiency that we like to see. And because the vital response is so blunted due to medication, we're not able to measure vitals and, and understand response to exercise and so we need to be careful when we are exercising when we're strength training and when we're doing conditioning that we are using RPE and that we are using the talk test right we want to keep it conversational we don't want to uh, redline this patient and, and have her unable to talk when we're when we're exercising we know then at that point the RP, RPE may be a little bit too high so knowing what we're measuring knowing what we're trying to do what does it actually look like in practice with a patient who is, is this medically complex, we need to do a really thorough warm up at the start of every session. Um, that can help with complaints of soreness, but it's also really gonna prepare the heart and the nervous system for things like strength training and conditioning. Um, oftentimes our warm up in the clinic looks like get on the new step for five minutes, which isn't skilled and also won't help us um, when we actually try to ask that patient to do something like a kettlebell deadlift or to ride the, the bike or do some box step ups or something like that. We need to really warm up the system and take 10 minutes or so, do some, some intervals on the bike and some general uh, specific and, and dynamic warm up and really prepare the heart and nervous system to exercise to get a good idea of, of what that patient is gonna be able to tolerate that session. Oftentimes folks come in, we immediately have them start strength training heavy or doing some conditioning and what do they do? They hit that wall, right? Their nervous system is not prepared. You all have probably felt this. If you haven't uh, warmed up enough when you went to exercise, you just started running. Uh, maybe you did last week's gut check, you did the assault bike and the burpee box jump overs, and you did not warm up properly, and you, you hit a wall um, after that first round because you did not warm up properly. So we need to warm these patients up really well and get an idea of how they're feeling and prepare them to do things. Back to them not having good cardiac efficiency, we need to carefully choose our strength training and our conditioning when we have them in the clinic and they're doing their therex. So we need to pick what are the one to two probably uh, most uh, efficient ways to get the job done strengthening wise. And so we're not doing a bunch of joint isolation work and packing on the volume and hypertrophy. Uh, but we're picking large muscle group exercises. So we want to strengthen the legs to lift and pick up kids and bend over. What are we going to do? Well, we're probably not going to do banded hip extensions, abduction, flexion, adduction, uh, quad sets, long arm quads, uh, knee extensions, and do eight to 10 lower body exercises. Let's just pick something that's very efficient that's gonna help us manage that volume goal and do something like a kettlebell deadlift, which is exactly what we're working on with this patient. We're working on sumo kettlebell deadlifts from a three inch block, so a 45 pound plate out in the gym, and we're keeping that volume low, something like five by five, uh, something like four by eight, but keeping the volume low, uh, knowing we don't wanna make this patient too sore, and that we wanna be able to complete all the work before this, this patient fatigues out. After picking one to two focused strength exercises, we need to focus a lot on conditioning, which is maybe something we're not comfortable with as, as PTs of, of programming uh, something like intervals or a, a moderate intensity, longer duration session, because again, the heart is a muscle and this patient needs to work, uh, yes, muscles for strength, but also needs to work the heart to build back that functional reserve to do things like babysit her kids all day or go for a walk or uh, do things around the house that she has not been able to do, but she wants to get back to doing. And so focusing on working in different types of intervals, uh, a good example is we did five rounds, we did 300 meters on the Concept 2 bike, and we did 20 box step ups, 
and then we rested two to one. So whatever that time was on the clock that she finished, we gave her double the amount of time to rest to really let uh, her, her recover her fatigue. And we're also being careful to do things like complementary movements. We, we want to work opposing muscle groups. That's gonna let us keep intensity up and keep fatigue away for as long as possible. This is not a patient that you would want to choose really redundant exercises and throw them together. If you did something like rowing and kettlebell swings, you're working the same muscle groups. And what do we know when we work the same muscle groups? We don't have as efficient lactate shuttling to send uh, pyruvate back to the liver uh, to make uh, glucose and lactate again to fuel further muscle contraction. We actually impair the ability of the body to do that. We increase metabolic stress. And this is a patient because of that cardiac uh, history that is already having a problem with that. And if we do a lot of redundant exercises paired together, she's going to have even more of a problem with that, which means, what does that translate to in front of your face? Increased fatigue and reduced ability to, to do any sort of appreciable work capacity. So make sure we're, we're doing complementary movements. Make sure we're doing something uh, like a lower body and upper body movement. Thinking of a workout we did here at the gym today, we did push presses and box step ups. So when your shoulders are working, your legs are resting. When your legs are working, your shoulders are resting. That lets us keep intensity high and get more work done in the same amount of time. So with these patients, make sure you're choosing a couple exercises that complement each other, that work different muscle groups so that we can keep that intensity moderate to, to higher and keep fatigue away for as long as possible. And then finally with a patient like this, we need to make sure we have time at the end of the hour for a nice cool down. We need to have five to 10 minutes to do some really low intensity flushing. Again, this is a patient that's already having trouble with fatigue. We need to make sure we, we convert um, that lactate back to pyruvate and glucose as much as possible so that this patient doesn't go home and sleep the rest of the day, right? Convert as much back as we can, five to 10 minutes of a low intensity cool down so that this patient is able to go home and do some more stuff besides just, just lay on the couch for the rest of the day. And that goes back to, to understanding complementary movements and a good warm up and a cool down. And so a patient like this can seem really scary when they first walk in uh, on paper when you're looking at their diagnosis. Maybe you get some, some medical history uh, before they come in for the evaluation and they can look like, oh, oh gosh, what, what, what could I possibly do with, with this person? There's so much going on. But, but start at the basics, figure out what their goals are, establish a good baseline with some assessments, really hone in on what they need to work on based on their goals and your assessments. And then, and then make sure uh, we get a really good warm up on board. We're being really intentional with any strength training that we need to do, and that we are really working on that cardiac conditioning uh, as much as possible, but in a smart way, right? Not, you know, not ride the bike for 30 minutes. Yes, that's gonna help your, your heart, but uh, not as much as it could be if we were much more diligent with programming things like intervals and making sure that in our therax, the, the exercises we're choosing are, are complementary to help keep intensity higher and keep fatigue away as long as possible. So it's been totally awesome to, uh, to work with this patient. Uh, definitely overcooked the first couple sessions, um, led to uh, a little bit of soreness, but, but educating that patient about soreness, uh, being careful with the volume, and this patient is now uh, helping a family member move this week. So she's, she's, she's back to such a, a high level of function compared to where she started. She doesn't even have, have time this week to come see me for PT. She's, uh, she's helping a family member move all week. And so in just a short amount of time, if we're really careful and diligent with programming, understanding uh, the, the cardiac response to exercise and monitoring uh, the response after exercise, we can help push these, these patients, even though they seem very complex, a long way in a short amount of time. So happy to take any questions you all have about this case or, or working with complex cardiac patients in general. Um, other than that, I hope you all have a great Tuesday. Hope to see you at a live course soon. If you signed up for virtual ice or you already signed up, we'll see you tonight on virtual ice. Other than that, have a great Tuesday. Have a great week. Bye, everybody. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.